It is Ticket Tuesday with Jake Kemp, producer of Bad Radio weekdays noon to three. Cowboys and Mavs post game duty on the ticket as well. We'll get into Jake's childhood with some youth <laughs> photos, how he Should got to the ticket, and more coming up. Have you ever watched Free for All before? Be honest. Don't lie. Absolutely. To me. Okay. I certainly have. I certainly have. I probably skew a little bit more towards the tickety episodes. Uh huh. Um, but I stopped watching in protest when Mike Soroy made a mockery of your program and your career. Uh, uns dissatisfied with making a mockery of his own career, he decided that uh, someone else should be in the crosshairs. But uh, I will watch tonight. Some will, some will say that, uh, because, well, you'll, you'll watch later because, of course, this is live. You'll watch the recording later tonight. Uh, some will say I'm making a mockery of my own career simply by doing this show. But anyway, we'll get into some ticket stuff and, and have some fun with that later. Let's continue on a topic I was just discussing. Should a fan base ever want its team to lose? Because a lot of Cowboys fans, and you're hearing this, were almost disappointed that Dallas beat Philadelphia because in those fans' minds, Dallas loses that game. It, it, it gets Garrett out of there more quickly. What and do you think? I want to be clear, first and foremost, I am a Cowboys fan. I grew up here. I'm a huge Cowboys fan still. I don't try to run this ruse that I'm an uh, impartial analyst. I am a fan of the team. Um, and so the way, the way I fall on it, which is a little bit uh, clunky, is uh, Monday until whenever they kick on Sunday, I would like them to lose that game. I would like them to fire their coach. I would like their uh, general manager to hire a guy who works at uh, in Fox's NFL broadcast to replace himself. But then whenever the ball is in the air, I still find myself pulling for the team. And I don't think that's that unnatural. You know, once you're actually watching it, you're watching it for the adrenaline. Uh, you're watching it because it's, you know, it's competition that you can enjoy. So I never find myself wanting them to lose when the game is actually going on. There are a lot of times during the week, particularly when their owner is giving five interviews saying things <laughs> that uh, make no sense. During those times, I do find myself uh, wandering over into the, eh, maybe it wouldn't be so bad if they lost this week. I don't think the Philly game really changes anything about the way I, I feel about this team in a fundamental way. So I guess I'm saying that it, the, the Philly game could, in fact, be a fluke. Uh, what, what, what say you on this? you think they can sustain anything resembling this effort for the rest of the year? Well, essentially what they're saying, uh, sustaining, is they're not getting too far away from 8-8 eight and eight, or 500 on the year, yeah, which I think they've true. proven they can sustain that. I fully expect them to finish the year somewhere between 7-8 and eight, nine wins. I don't think – I think what the end, at the end of the day we've seen, regardless of what we think of him as a tactician or what we think of his message, I think the team does fight for Jason Garrett. I do think that they – uh, go to war for him. And if you're willing to do that for your coach, you're never going to end up losing, you know, 10, 11, 12 games, barring, you know, a catastrophic injury. I, I texted you this morning, late this morning, and asked why you hate Dak Prescott so much, <laughs> because that, that's the feeling I've gotten from you on, on, on the show. But I think a lot of people who observe this team don't know what to make of Dak, and that's certainly the case with me within the I said this to Drew Pearson last night, within the course of a, of a quarter or two drives, I can have totally different opinions from one to the other on, on this guy. Do you think he's the long-term answer, or do the Cowboys have to protect themselves in that regard? I think he could be the long-term answer, but I think you have to coach him up much more than you do some of these other quarterbacks. And I just don't know that I'm ever confident uh, that anywhere in the future that Jerry's going to hire a coach that I think of as a guy who's top five and really gets the most out of his players. I think he's fine, but I think to win in the NFL, you need a quarterback that can consistently beat you, particularly on third down, with his arms. And we've really seen him only be great whenever everything was great around him. You know, they had perfect health on their offensive line that year. Their uh, running back had yet to get suspended or have a suspension hanging over him. Uh, and in that year, he was great. But I don't know that you can plan for perfect conditions all the time. So I love the guy. And again, to go back to going to war, I think the guy is a, is a, he's a fighter. I think the team loves him. But long term, I don't really buy that he's the answer. You know, I was wrong, and I'm willing to say so, about the selection of Leighton Vander Esch. I would have rather they had taken a ride receiver, uh, Ridley, perhaps. Sure. And Ridley may end up being a really good player as well. He's shown glimpses early on. But all indications of this Vander Esch kid are that he could really be something special. He's been really impressive uh, early on here, too. Yeah, I was totally wrong as well. Uh, I loved Ridley, but it's probably because you get to see Ridley and guys like that. And now Amari Cooper play their college games. Everyone's watching them play in college, so we're much more familiar with them than maybe we are a Boise State linebacker. Have you seen a lot of eight-man Idaho no. football? No, no okay. I had not uh, had a chance to hop on the Van Der Esch family bus <laughs> and hit up any, uh, any Boise State games. And, and I think also that people, they undervalue the position of, uh, of an inside linebacker. I think that's somewhat antiquated thinking because I think that those guys have to cover the pass so much more now than they used to. That's an invaluable skill, and I think he has it uh, for days. So maybe not quite as valuable as an outside back or a pass rusher, but I think more valuable now than maybe it was 10, 20 years ago. 
You do the Mavs post game show as well. Jay Kemp, our guest from the ticket. Before we close out this segment, just a word on, on the Mavericks and, uh, and Luca. Oh. Is he what you thought he would be? Has he exceeded your expectations here for a guy who's just getting his NBA career underway? Uh, he's everything I thought he would he would be and more. So ex- exceeded by by a long shot. Um, and I had gotten pretty prepared for the idea that he might uh, be there, or the Mavericks might be able to trade up and get him, or maybe if they'd won the lottery by watching a lot of his games from Europe. Uh, and I just don't know that uh, the American casual NBA fan understands how good those European leagues are now. And not so much just that the the skills uh, are are fantastic, but you're still having to prepare to play like an adult. You're having to prepare to play like a professional athlete every day. So you could uh, compare and contrast him with Dennis Smith Jr., who I'm not out on by any means, but two and a half years ago, Dennis Smith Jr. was basically playing high school and AAU basketball. You may play 30 games. Uh, you're not really having to treat your body like a professional, whereas Luke has been doing that for three or four years now. And I think you can see that it kind of shows both uh, not only in the way that they play, but in kind of the way that they handle themselves between plays. About a minute to go. This is all fine and good with Luca and Dennis Smith Jr. and the young guys, but how long before this team is good again? The patience that fans are willing to show toward the Mavericks never ceases to amaze me as, as opposed to the Cowboys. But next year, should this be a playoff team, for example? Uh, I think that they can be a playoff team next year. Now, if you want to talk about good, good, I think they're still a little bit ways away from that. As uh, as we referenced, Smith Jr. is just now turning 21. Luke is still 19. So I think you could give them a few years from now um, before they're really what they're going to be. And at that point, I think they might be a team that can threaten the top half of the West. You'll see the Rockets getting older, the Warriors getting older. Now, of course, there'll be other threats, but I think they at least have two guys who are winning pieces. And uh, when it comes to paying players, Cuban may not necessarily be a fan of doing that if the guy's on the wrong side of 30, but if they're on the right side, I think he'll open up the pocketbook, and I expect both those guys to be here for a long time and contribute to winning. We'll go behind the scenes at the ticket with Jake, the guys oh, oh, that, great. He, that he avoids <laughs> at all costs when they are walking down the hallway at him. Uh, that's coming up next. Back in free for all with the tickets, Jake Kemp. You mentioned earlier that you're a Cowboy fan because you grew up around here. Where did you grow up? You sent us some little kid photos earlier. We'll see those here as you talk about your childhood. I grew up in North Richland Hills and went to Richland High School, the Rebels, but after they got rid of the flag and stuff, so that's not on me. Uh, I think that's probably my first Halloween right there. That's very masculine. Um, a bunny, which I think my mom said I wore for a month or two. Way ahead of the curve, fashion forward here. Uh, pink shirt, black and white, uh, mid-top Nike. So uh, that's my much more successful than me younger brother. Uh, he does not host the president's favorite morning show, but he has still done pretty well for himself. Uh, <laughs> like my cousin. I, I nice. believe this is when I was in my Beavis and Butthead phase. Who didn't have one of those in the 90s? <laughs> uh, and then this is when I thought I was the, ne- uh, the next Darcy Walkaluck uh, because I got really, really into the stars when they first got here. And uh, this is me on my... Uh, my road to stardom as a uh, pop punk superstar uh, playing in bands in high school and shortly thereafter. Does everybody at the ticket play, play the guitar or is it just my imagination? That's the only reason I learned how to play is because I thought if I want to do this long term, if I want to work there, I've got to learn. <laughs> uh, you at least have to have some sort of passing knowledge of the guitar, your, your major chords. So you were a sports fan from the get-go as a kid? Oh just... yeah, for sure, for sure. Any sort of competition. I think um, particularly if you have a younger brother, we're only two, year, two and a half years apart. Um, so the ability to just bully ball him any chance I could get until he passed me in weight at about 15. Uh, we were constantly competing in anything we could do, whether it was sports or video games, which were usually sports video games. Um, but I mean, growing up around here, I think that's pretty normal. Everybody's just, that's how you grow up, go to games. So what was the, the path that, that led you to the ticket? What'd you do before that? Uh, so I went to, I actually applied to uh, the University of Texas out of uh, high school and did not get in, which everyone is um, often to remind me. Um, but so I stuck around here at first and went to UTA while trying to get into UT. And during that time, I got an internship with the Hardline, um, which is just a great nurturing environment for an 18 uh, year old kid to get into. Uh, so I was with them for a couple of years. What was the first lesson they taught you as an intern? Do you remember? Uh, most of Hold them the are mustard not, when you, most when of you them go are not the arable. <laughs> most of them are not arable. I do remember the first day that I was there, they had a, uh, the nighttime show had a producer named Kyle Turley. And he was eating what they had called the Tower of Smeat, which was literally just the Tower of, of Smeat, which is like a fake meat, right? Okay. A process. And I remember leaving there and calling my mom that day. She's like, how's your first day at uh, your big radio internship? I'm like, well, they had me go buy like 20 cans of of fake meat. So 
Um, but then I ended up going to Texas State, finishing up there, came back and uh, got the coveted overnight board op job on the weekend in 2007 and just been on the grind since then and uh, keep getting lucky, I guess. How much do you stay out of human resources? Also, which is, <laughs> that's the first thing you told me whenever I came uh, to town. Always a good tip. How much do you resent the fact that you, that you have to be a producer at this point and that you're not a, a big time host during the week? Uh, You've told me off camera that it's really a bone of contention. First thing I think about when I wake up. Last thing I think about uh, before I go to sleep. It pretty much uh, consumes me. Um, I think it's it's uh, it's it's there's something going on. I don't know who's got something on somebody up there. Um, and that I don't have as far as, you know, damning materials back to HR. Um, but uh, it's, it's uh, no, nah, man, those guys are great. They give me plenty of opportunity to create and fill in. Um, I was a P1 before I worked there. Yeah. You know, I grew up that way. Uh, my dad was a huge listener. So it's a very special thing for me. Uh, I try not to take it for granted, even whenever, you know, people are, you know, yelling at you or whatever you let affect you with, uh, with reaction to things. I mean, I, I love working there. Um, it's really like, it's my identity. And, and Bob and Dan especially have just been, they're, we clown each other, but they're incredible to work with. Yeah, it's obviously a great fit, and you get to do a lot of different things. You know, we talk about the post-game show, so that you're able to touch the, the hardcore sports page by talking about a Cowboy game immediately in the aftermath sure. or a Mavs game as well. Uh, we'll be teaming up, you and I, uh, during morning drive during Christmas time, right? We'll be keeping morning drive hopping the week of like the 15th right in there. You got any, any plans? I, I've been thinking about the, uh, the stretch. I think we're doing four shows together. I have specific segments in mind already. Uh, I do not, but I will have plans by the 14th. Um, and my wife is due uh, with our first child on January 9th. Um, so I can make this promise to you that uh, if the baby is born before then, I'll just bring the baby to the studio and we'll let her oh. do Gordon's role. Uh, so you and I will kind of do the George, George and Craig, and we'll just let a baby handle the mid-segments. The segments. maturity level would be comparable. <laughs> right? Exactly, right. Exactly, it works. No, it's, uh, I'm really excited to work with you. You've always been great to me as well, so I'm looking forward to it. Should be fun, and I have nothing planned. Anybody who's worked <laughs> with me on the ticket knows that I just, I just leech off those guys to try to uh, make the show happen. I've well, made a career out of it. <laughs> we'll, we'll have much more with Jake from the ticket coming up. Twitter questions, at least one of them from one of your colleagues. That's ahead when we continue. Back in Free For All with the Tickets Jake Kemp. We're going to take some Twitter questions now. I've seen a few of these, but not all of them. So we'll be learning about them for the first time together on a few. Let's go with number real, one. Real quick, I want to get to this real quick, Mike. Uh, it's, it's super, super hot in here. I know you guys have an older <laughs> staff here, um, but it's really, really warm. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go jack it off here real quick. Oh, okay. Um, and while we're at it, I think I'm also I'm probably just going to pop the top off. Oh, no. And, uh, oh, brother. Here gonna, we go. I'm probably just going to roll with this for the rest of the time while we're here. If everybody's cool with that, get my, uh, oh, we got? Get my Lucas there City edition out. Under there. Yeah. So I'm just going to kind of roll with this for those uh, Twitter questions there, if you don't mind. Go check out uh, Luca and the Mavs. Oh, got the Luca. Nice. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, I'm going to get this mic. Oh, we got a mic there. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Oh, allow me to assist here, Jake. That's sure. what I live for. Yeah. Take care of your mic maintenance. Yeah, I got there it. There we go. There we'll you go. right on here, maybe. So if you want to get a shot of those. Okay. This is the kind of spontaneous yeah. edginess we're, uh, we're looking for. Maybe <laughs> for the home viewers there. That's for the ladies. <laughs> I know you guys are big <laughs> with that. Wow. Okay. How about that there, Mike. Here we go. I'm just going to keep this jacket buttoned, if you don't mind. Hey, Jake, I was just wondering randomly and kind of conversationally from Absolutely. Twitter, which ticket personality would you least like to take on at fight night? Uh, it's probably got to be Norm, right? Because I don't think you could live that down. You know, I think if you yeah. gave Norm a, you know, a, a right to the kisser and it, and it, and it ended him, uh, I think you'd probably feel bad about that forever. So I'm a very guilty per uh, person by nature, and I think I would take that tough. Next one I'm going to run through. You've already answered it. When will you have your own show on the ticket? Never. Kick Bomb and Dan to the curb. We know probably how bitter never. you are. Here's one from Dan. From Dan, ask him why he cares <laughs> so little for your show that he didn't ask Bob or Dan to promote his appearance. Well, I actually did, and we had it planned out, but then one of them had a story about um, going to the gas station. Um, which was apparently so riveting that that, uh, that preempted this. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, if they have something exciting, well, heaven forbid. You talked <laughs> you talked around. about becoming a dad. I know how excited you are about that. In, in fact, yes, taking credit for it there. So that was one of the Twitter questions about becoming the dad of a baby girl. I didn't say it was mine. I just said I was going to raise it. But sure. Well, there. I know everything will go really <laughs> well. Finally, do you like space? No, I do not. 
I think this country wastes a lot of money on uh, on, on you space research. You have say the drop, say the drop. You have a. Can we say uh, that? Yeah, There's I think no way so. you can say that. Yes, you can. No, I'm not. You're I'm not getting. I'm not. Okay. Nah. We're not going to say it. I'm never going to get that, that hosting job if I keep making uh, homophobic slurs. <laughs> Ticket <not> P1s <laughs> know what the drop is. <laughs> uh, there he is in all his glory. Thanks, Mike. Guns blaring, Jake Kemp. 77. From the ticket.